Hi everyone, this lesson is on the condition known as frozen shoulder, which is also known as adhesive capsulitis. So this condition is also known as frozen shoulder syndrome or FSS. It is a condition involving pain and immobility or stiffness of the shoulder. And it is a progressive condition, which means it gets worse over time. And we'll talk about this in more detail when we talk about the clinical features of this condition. So adhesive capsulitis is actually broken down into two types. One is known as primary adhesive capsulitis, which is going to be adhesive capsulitis that the underlying cause is not known, which means that it's idiopathic, or secondary adhesive capsulitis, which is going to be due to some other underlying cause. We're going to talk about a wide variety of causes in the next slide. So frozen shoulder syndrome is more likely to affect patients between the ages of 40 to 60, and the lifetime estimate of having this condition is 2 to 5 percent of the general population. And females are more likely to be affected with this condition than male patients, and it is roughly four times higher likelihood in females compared to males. Let's talk about some of the etiologies of secondary adhesive capsulitis. So as mentioned before, primary adhesive capsulitis is where the underlying cause is not known, so it's idiopathic, but secondary adhesive capsulitis has a wide variety of causes. One of them is going to be prolonged shoulder immobilization, which means that the shoulder is not going to be moved for a very long period of time. This is actually a very important cause of this condition. We can also see diabetes being an important underlying cause of adhesive capsulitis as well. And this is considered to be an independent risk factor, and it's actually shown to increase the likelihood of having adhesive capsulitis by nearly five times. So it's five times more likely to occur in diabetic patients than non-diabetic patients. Having Hyperthyroidism, which is a high-functioning thyroid, is also an associated cause of this condition. Parkinson's disease is also another potential underlying cause. We can also see having a stroke as an important associated factor with adhesive capsulitis, and we can also see having a shoulder injury being an important cause of this condition as well. And all three of these can lead to reduced mobility of the shoulder, which increases the likelihood of having this condition. And another one is going to be complex regional pain syndrome, which is another associated factor as well. And then having cancer can also be an underlying cause of secondary adhesive capsulitis. So let's talk about the pathophysiology here. So this would be the shoulder joint. And the shoulder is enveloped by the glenohumeral joint capsule, which is also known as the shoulder capsule. And this capsule is a layer of connective tissue. Now, what happens in adhesive capsulitis is that there is capsular inflammation the glenohumeral joint capsule or the shoulder capsule becomes inflamed. This inflammation appears to be related to cytokine mediated action and it is progressive in the sense that as the inflammation continues and starts to reduce, the capsule itself is replaced by fibrosis or thickening. So the capsule becomes thickened over time due to that prolonged progressive inflammation. So again, there is inflammation of that shoulder capsule. Over time that inflammation starts to reduce, but due to that inflammation, the capsule starts to become fibrotic, so it becomes thickened. And this thickening appears to be related to a proliferation of fibroblasts in that joint capsule. So this is the reason why this occurs as well. So let's talk about the clinical features of adhesive capsulitis. So before we talk about the clinical features, it's important to note that the non-dominant shoulder is more likely to be affected. So this condition is going to be unilateral, meaning that it's only going to affect one shoulder as opposed to both shoulders, although bilateral cases can occur in rare instances. And again, often this can be related to mobility issues, the non-dominant shoulder being less utilized. And what will be the hallmark findings in adhesive capsulitis is pain and stiffening. And they're going to occur in a particular pattern, which we're going to talk about here in a moment. So there's going to be three phases of adhesive capsulitis, the freezing phase, the frozen phase, and the thawing phase. So in the freezing phase, as its name implies, it occurs slowly over time, and it involves pain, which progressively worsens. And this pain is going to be diffuse. It's going to be located over the outer shoulder and the upper arm. And it's going to often occur over six to nine months, or up to nine months. So this is going to be the phase where we're going to see inflammation of the joint capsule. Now in the frozen phase, we start to see a progressive stiffening. So this corresponds with the pathophysiology where the inflammation starts to reduce, but it's going to lead to this fibrosis of that joint capsule. So the joint capsule becomes harder to move and it becomes stiff. So this is often going to lead to severe restriction of movement. 
especially external rotation is going to be limited. So if you're trying to externally rotate your arm, it's very difficult, it becomes very stiff. Now in this phase, because it corresponds to that reduction in inflammation, pain can actually improve in this phase. And this phase occurs over four to 20 months. And then the last phase is going to be the thawing phase. This is going to be where there's going to be very slow and gradual resolution of symptoms. The range of motion of the shoulder slowly improves and there may be some residual pain. And if there is, it's going to resolve in this phase. And this is going to occur over five to 26 months. Now these are on average the timelines for these phases and some cases it may differ, but these are the general timelines as to when the patient goes through a freezing phase, frozen phase, and thawing phase. So how do clinicians diagnose adhesive capsulitis? So this is going to be a clinical diagnosis. Getting the history, seeing that there was prolonged shoulder immobility is going to be very important, or if the patient has diabetes and they have this characteristic progression and pattern of signs and symptoms, that's going to be enough to make the diagnosis. For the clinical diagnosis though, symptoms must have persisted for at least three months. So this is going to be important. And some other criteria will suggest at least one month, but the criteria for diagnosis is going to involve symptoms for many months. So this is often going to be what's going to happen because again, this is a long drawn out condition. Now, radiological imaging may be used in some cases, so x-ray can be used, and musculoskeletal ultrasonography can be used in some cases. These are mostly going to be used to rule out other conditions. As we see with adhesive capsulitis, these imaging modalities are often going to be normal. So again, it's used to rule out other conditions. Once a clinician has made the diagnosis, how do they treat adhesive capsulitis? So this is going to be a self-limiting condition. So primary adhesive capsulitis resolves on its own within nine to 18 months, up to three years on average. And oftentimes secondary adhesive capsulitis has a poor prognosis. So it may take longer or may be more difficult to fully resolve. So the treatments we're going to talk about here are going to be broken down into whether or not they're used in the freezing phase or the thawing phase. So in the freezing phase, pain management is going to be very important. So utilizing non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAIDs like ibuprofen, Motrin, naproxen, these can all help with reducing some of the inflammation in the joint capsule, but also reducing the pain, which is going to be helpful in preventing further immobility. If the patient has pain in that shoulder, they often will not use that shoulder much, and that can actually worsen the condition. Another way of dealing with the pain can be a corticosteroid injection as well. And then therapy is going to be important in the freezing phase. So physiotherapy, doing passive and active range of motion exercises. And all of this, again, has to do with the fact that movement improves resolution. Because of that pain and that limited use of the shoulder, this can lead to worsening, thickening of the joint capsule. And the reason is, is because some of the main causes of this condition are shoulder immobility. So when this condition starts, you start to have pain in the shoulder and you're less likely to use it. This is actually going to lead to more immobility. So you're going to use the shoulder even less than you should. And this is going to worsen that thickening of the joint capsule. So the stiffness and the freezing of the shoulder is going to be worse. So pain management, keeping the pain low so the patient uses their shoulder more, and then doing physiotherapy, those range of motion exercises are going to be very important in this phase. And then the other treatment's going to occur during the thawing phase. So most cases are going to resolve slowly on their own, but if there is limited improvement, surgery may be utilized in limited cases. So one surgery technique can be manipulation under anesthesia. So what happens is patient is put under anesthesia and then there is very rigorous movement of the shoulder to essentially break the shoulder capsule, that thickened shoulder capsule that prevents movement. So this is one way of dealing with this condition. And the other one is arthroscopic capsular release. Again, breaking through that thickened capsule, allowing the patient to be able to move their arm or shoulder properly. So these are the treatment methods for frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis. If you want to learn more about other musculoskeletal or rheumatological conditions, please check out my lessons on those topics. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.